Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, this is the, the session on how can women's um, rights and gender equality be better promoted within social movements. No? Um, my name is Marike Krakiza. I'm one of the members of the Coordinating Committee of Social Watch. Uh, but I'm also here in my capacity as one of the advisors of the ID Institute for Development Studies Cutting Edge Program on Gender and Social Movements. Shrinata Bhatiwala is our lead advisor. She is a friend to many of us in and out of Social Watch. She would have wanted to be here. In fact, she had made plans to be here to, to join us in this discussion. Unfortunately, because of health problems, uh, she could not make it. No? So when she sends her warm regards uh, and wishes us success for this session. Um, just to say that the cutting edge path, uh, which is a project of the Institute of Development Studies, has many intended outputs, one of which is an overview report on, this, on the issue of well, gender and social movements. It will talk about some of the key concepts, frameworks, concrete examples and case studies about you know, how, how these two movements interact and engage with each other. But we would like to go beyond producing just a mere document. No? We want to engage in a much more proactive strategy. So what we wanted to do really, and this was discussed in the, in the advisory group, was how do we catalyze debates, discussions um, around these issues? How do we proactively put it back in the minds of people? Getting more people to think about it and generating additional insights as well as possible strategies uh, on this issue. And it was in that context that the advisory group said, what are the different arenas and venues that we can engage in where we can generate some debate and discussion on gender and social movements? And the Social Watch Global Assembly, we felt, was an obvious choice. Because the Social Watch Global Assembly is a gathering of leaders in the social justice movements uh, around the world. So we felt that this was an important arena to get insights and conversations around this issue. And so we are very grateful to Social Watch for giving us this important space to, to discuss. No? talk about this, this issue. Um, basically, the objectives of the project are, are three. First is we would like to know how do we promote the goals and common understanding between women's movements and social justice movements? How do we further strengthen a shared understanding and analysis? The second has to do with how do we promote honest discussion of the obstacles and challenges in integrating and highlighting gender equality in the women's rights, in women's rights, in the work of social justice movements, and strengthen how we can work together on, in a more engaged and constructive way. The third objective is how to promote and how to provide spaces and opportunities for the different for, the, for for us in the movements to further come together. So basically, in a nutshell, these are the main goals of the project. Um, we are extremely fortunate and privileged to have uh, someone in the person of Lydia Alpizar to help us through the discussion. Uh, she is the executive director of the Association for Women's Rights and Development for AWID. As we know, AWID has consistently played a key role in providing a platform for women around the world to highlight issues for women's rights and gender equality. And Libya will navigate us through this uh, very interesting conversation in the afternoon. Uh, without further ado, uh, turning, off, turning, on, turning over the mic to Libya. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Vivian, and hi, everybody. Uh, thank you very much also for the invitation to moderate the panel as uh, 
Mari Vase in Sri Lanka, unfortunately, cannot join them, but she was supposed to be here to do this. So it's, um, I'm really happy to be able to, to moderate. Um, I just, just a few um, thoughts before we start uh, and reiterate uh, um, a few of the things that Mari was saying. Um, one is that this discussion is not so much of gender and social movements in general, but about talking about how diverse social movements take up gender equality and women's rights, key demands and issues as part of the role, and, and how we build solidarity um, between movements that are advancing gender equality and women's rights issues as a major focus, and other social movements um, that are advancing similar issues, but not necessarily with the gender equality and women's rights perspective. And I think I mean, one of the key assumptions that the project uh, of Bridge Ideas uh, has made um, is one, the basic transformation happens when collective action takes place, and collective action is at the heart of social movements, and therefore, um, how do we build collective action and different connections is really central to these processes of transformation. Uh, and secondly, I guess something that we have learned very much is um, in the capacity to build alliances with each other, different social movements can really enhance the kind of impact that our work can have. Clearly, um, there have been um, challenges and great opportunities as well in the way that different social movements have come together um, with um, women's rights movements to advance different agendas. Um, and today, the idea is that we can have quite an informal, let me say, conversation about a few questions um, to guide the discussion. Basically, we're asking the different speakers, based on their experiences, what are some of the key insights and thoughts and, um, and learnings that they have had when it has come to engaging with gender equality and human rights issues. Um, so, I'm going to introduce the speakers very briefly. Um, so, we have four people. We have um, Simon Stoker from, as the director of the European Solidarity Towards Equal Participation to People, Eristep, um, based in Brussels, and he's been part of Social Watch since the beginning. And he does a lot of work in terms of the role of the European Union and the impact um, in different parts of the world. We also have Emily Sikazu, um, who is the Executive Director of Women's for Change, uh, co-chair for Social Watch, and she's done a lot of work and activism on, um, on gender and, and human rights. Um, we also have uh, Gigi Francisco, um, who is the coordinator of the Open Alternatives for Women for a New Era, uh, Dawn, and she's based here in the Philippines. And she's also a professor. Um, and we also have Roberto, who is, as you all know, the coordinator of Social Watch International, a very well known um, activist on, on social issues, human rights, and also gender equality as well. Um, using a little bit of a feminist methodology here, before each of you speak, I would really like to ask you to speak in terms of. Um, the social movement experience that we're going to be bringing into the conversation. Because I'm sure that several of you have bumped into these questions on how you engage with gender equality and women's rights, not only in terms of one movement, but probably in the interaction of your participation in different social movements, so that we can better understand where your opinions and insights from this conversation come from. Um, so, um, and also the other thing that we're going to do is we're going to focus the conversation on really key questions. So instead of having no presentations from each of you, we're just going to go through each of the questions and give you five minutes um, to respond. And the idea is that you can also engage with each other and appeal to on each other's um, um, interventions. Um, so the first um, question, and um, it's one that says, um, Based on the words that IDS and, and Bridge have done so far in thinking, there is this sense that uh, somehow women's rights and gender equality movements have integrated many different issues that are part of other social movements and struggles. Um, and there has been a lot of solidarity in the field. But there is this sense that uh, all the social movements that are outside feminist and women's rights movements have not been an open and keen to take up as part of their agendas key women's rights and gender equality issues, for example, around prophylactic rights, 
um, sexual violence, um, and so on. So the first key question is, why do you think this is so? Um, do you agree with that first? And why do you think this is so? So who wants to go first? Oh, and remember to say which kind of movement experience you have that is important in your okay. um, participation. I'm an African and a Pan-Africanist for that matter. So I can speak uh, on my experiences with Africa. I can also speak on my experiences within the women's movement and social movements in Zambia. So I can talk about Women for Change as a movement. I can also talk about Oasis Forum as a movement. And since I co-chair social work, I can also speak from that perspective. Um, I don't think that the social movements have not embraced issues around women's rights, more especially reproductive rights, or um, violence against women only. There are many issues that affect women that social movements have not embraced. And this is not because uh, they don't understand the issues. I think because there's a hidden hand in what people perceive, including our brothers in the movements that uh, call themselves sometimes, some of our brothers, feminists, they still have a hidden hand, which is socialization, cultures, and tradition that stop them without them understanding why they are reluctant to march forward and say, this is our issue. And so I can speak about um, many movements, including that of India. You know in India there's femicide, and yet the issues around that are looked at as issues for women only. But when it comes to land rights, all the activists in India will stand up and say, this is our issue. And not on femicide. A very few of our brothers will stand up for that. In Women for Change, I know that we have a policy as an affirmative action one, which we said, among the 750,000 rural groups that we work with, chairperson shall be female, treasurers shall be female. And this was to showcase that women can be leaders, but women can also control the party strings, as clear as that. And it went on to the board. The board shall be chaired by a female, and the treasurer of the board shall be female, including the trustees. They are three, two of them are women, and the chair is women, and there's a man only to showcase that women can be leaders and can take up leadership roles. But even as we are a gender movement, you still get resistance. Why is it like this? And so you can see that they understand the issue, but there's a hand that is saying, no, it cannot be like this. In the Oasis Forum, again in Zambia, where the, all the major churches, together with the women's movement, work together. And we work together very beautifully on issues around our women's rights to be enshrined in the constitution. No issues, but again, the behavior in the movement, you can tell that they're actually reluctant, although they are saying they are with us on the issue. When it comes to gender-based violence, we would go and say all the bishops, all the reverends, and whatever they call them, pastors, this week, in December, 16 days of activism against gender violence. You are all going to preach in all your churches, on all your pulpits, about gender-based violence. Many of them did, but you could also see some saying, no, but is this an issue for the church? And this is a movement that we have worked together so closely with. So of course there are experiences like those. Um, and experiences in social work, we have a very strong gender team on the social watch, a CC. But um, you can see that in different countries, that issue is also taken on differently. And yet, there are grassroots movements, whether you are talking about Senegal, whether you are talking about uh, Mali, whether Cameroon, whether Kenya, whether Uganda, whether um, 
Ghana, you can still see that some members of the movement are still reluctant. So there's a cultural aspect of this. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. So, do you want to go? Thank you very much. Um, in terms of my experience, it's been, it's been, uh, it's been, uh, it's been uh, I've, I've worked in the NGO community for a long time and part of Social Watch, and, and, uh, and so it's, it's, it's in that context. But I wanted, I wanted to start by kind of making an analogy. I live in Belgium. And it's a country which has two languages, uh, Dutch and French. And whereas the Dutch-speaking people of Belgium will learn French because they know they need to, the French-speaking uh, community in Belgium are much more reluctant to do so because they don't feel that Dutch is particularly important. And I think it's the reason I give that is because I think the motivation is about the needs. And to a certain extent, I think that the question of, of um, uh, gender justice and social movements is a little bit in that, in that context. Social movements are looking at how, uh, how you bring change, but that doesn't necessarily uh, have to, in practical terms, embrace uh, gender justice. Uh, in theory, of course, and if I look at, uh, in, the European, in the European context, if I look at uh, um, the commitment in rhetorical terms to gender justice and gender equality. It's a ton of papers, a ton of paper, um, positions, policies, and the rest of it. Um, and the indicators that you use tend to be about uh, positive, uh, positive indicators about women being involved in this, women, uh, the, the need for uh, gender parity in, in, uh, in this, in Parliament, or the rest of it. Um, but it doesn't necessarily just address gender justice per se. And I think that's the uh, and that's the the, uh, the reality. Only yesterday I was looking uh, at the news on the European uh, the European level and a, a commissioner has said we need more um, we need more women um, leaders in business and I have no doubt that is true. Um, but is that the solution? Because in the end I think it comes down to something that is much, much more personal. And that is about an attitude um, of individuals and how you and how you uh, look at these things. And so what I wanted to do, if you permit me, is just to say a little bit about myself. Because, I mean, I, I assume I'm sitting here because there's a feeling that I'm, uh, I'm okay in relation, to, <laughs> in relation to the issue. But as a... As a uh, as somebody who was born and brought up in, in England, uh, without any um, without any relationship with an international kind of perspective, in a, a middle class family in which uh, was uh, well off, relatively well off, my um, my parents were conservatives, but the one thing that they did do was was give me the sense of uh, the need for justice and the need the need for principle. You know, so some people say I'm part of principle, and, and I won't uh, I won't let go because principle is uh, is more important than, than most other things. Um, but in my own approach, um, I went to I went to university in Wales, where I started learning something about the relationship between different cultures and different people, uh, and that's where that's where a lot of kind of my ideas in relation to the world comes from. But but I think that in that context, the justice, uh, the need to respect, uh, to recognize uh, the roles of different people, the role of, of, of different people in, in general, became, became very important. There was one point I was given the, uh, the title of honorary woman in an organization I was working for. Um, I didn't apply for it, but, uh, but they gave it to me anyway. But it's, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that it's, it's something which if you don't embrace it as an individual, then the chances are it's not sitting there and it's not something which um, will naturally come to you. And in, in the context of social movements, um, leaders are conditioned by what they are. 
it's not, uh, they may be leaders and they may have political convictions, they may be progressive, they may, but in the end, what they come from and, and it's right, what they come from, their culture, and the rest of it defines them. And I think, therefore, if you want to deal with this issue, if you want a strategy, then you actually have to look at how do you get to people and what they are and how they relate to it. And in the end, it isn't just about um, money. It's about getting men to recognize uh, the validity of the equality and, and how you do with that. And, and, and I think that's the challenge. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, my name is Gigi Francisco. I'm from Dawn, and um, I'd like to talk a little bit um, in an extended way of the Dawn perspective because this will uh, make you understand better some of the things that uh, we as an organization or a network bring to the debate. Um, one is that we, of course, I don't think this is anything controversial. Uh, but that we all know that women's movements and social movements have been interacting in various ways at various times and whether they are in the sphere of the national or the local or the global, there have been interactions. So this question of what is the relationship of social movements and women's movements, we would, of course, be very interested to find out what the context is. What is the political context and objective of the question itself. Uh, number two, uh, for instance, what has happened to the social justice movement and what has happened also or have happened to women's movements that we now raise this big question in front of us. And number two, social movements have always had women's caucuses, communities, and women's arms. So in other words, uh, you know, and many of these women's arms in the past had also been members of women's movements, uh, again, at various levels. So we're not, again, here talking of two completely separate uh, movements, because there are a lot of intersections. There is, in fact, some, most of the time, incestuous uh, same-sex uh, intersections. No? Uh, number three, um, both social movements and women's movements are diverse and plural. Uh, I probably will not want to uh, relate with some social movements that are misogynist or that are patriarchal and that are extremist and are not uh, having the same ideological orientation uh, in a progressive, politically progressive sense that uh, we uh, have in, in Dawn. And so, you know, again, we have to nuance the uh, the question, although I did hear that, you know, the questions about uh, women's movements uh, working for gender equality and women's rights uh, and social justice movements, but then again, the whole question of social justice is in itself, in some parts of it contested, highly contested, even among self-identified social justice movements, uh, participants or actors. Uh, in terms of um, of Don's own uh, context, uh, Don came into uh, the realm of the international women's movement around the Nairobi conference, and since then we have been engaging with the anal uh, our analysis and advocacy has been focused more at global governance. And uh, uh, this is not about flying here and there between New York and Geneva or Brussels. Uh, this is about uh, we began with a critique of structural adjustment programs where we said in uh, 1984 and, and in, again in uh, 1986 that there are certain structural adjustment programs that had been uh, agreed upon at the global level which limit the uh, institutional process open for alternatives uh, at the grassroots level. So things that uh, are struggles at the global level for institutional space for progressive uh, ideas are very much linked to the, the local, but I, I suppose what Don's distinctive <coughs> characteristic is, is that we tend to focus on the relationship or the impact of global, um, global agreements on uh, the possibilities as well as the constraints for, um, for transformation and emancipation at the local and national uh, levels. Uh, at this point, um, the 
coming together or enlarging of networks uh, and movements uh, should also be probably problematize itself. No? This is not about being get being larger and growing bigger and bigger. Uh, I mean, uh, we have, uh, for instance, uh, seen in some areas that uh, even growth itself cannot be exponentially uh, getting, you know, bigger and bigger. And at a certain point, you know, really the massiveness of growth won't matter anymore for social equality and. Uh, and I think Wilkinson, no, we just have to read uh, Wilkinson on, on this. But uh, but but uh, so, so the, the same question is a debate within Don. I mean, I mean, we're questioning that. So what is what is social movements collective action? Is it bigger? Is it doing things all over the world in different capitals? Uh, is it signatures of 1,000 organizations on a sign-on? I mean, what, what is really, is that one form or are there other forms, no? or is it a combination of, of many forms? And finally, to say that the, it, the, the debate itself has to be contextualized within runaway financialization in the period of globalization and how uh, including and how uh, this includes an effect on funding available for social movements and women's rights organizations. We cannot uh, decontextualize the work that we do, um, which is um, dependent on funds, uh, from what are, have, has been a completely, you know, runaway uh, financialization that has itself. Uh, created uh, a lot of risk and uncertainties to those who are actually promoting uh, corporate power. So I'll, uh, I'll end here uh, to say that we look forward to the debate and we hope that you know we could uh, deepen uh, and drill uh, through some of these uh, complexities uh, and, and not bring up the question of uh, social movements and women's rights as if they are two independent variables with certain elements without any historically um, accumulated experiences and, and dynamics. Yes, I was only told that I should be here a couple of hours ago. And, uh, hmm? Yes, so, so don't expect of me like a pre prepared speech or, or analysis. And uh, when I was invited, I remember uh, once in the UN, we were in the NGO speaking slot of some international conference, and then they called to the floor to speak uh, the mothers of America. And a white guy in suit and tie next to me took the microphone and said, I am speaking on behalf of mothers of America. And I can speak on behalf of Mothers of America because I am American and I have a mother. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> I uh, have a gender, so can participate in a gender <laughs> workshop, I guess. Um, on the other hand, if we take anecdotal evidence, a few months ago, several of us were in Dakar um, at the inauguration of the World Social Forum, which is like the most advanced expression of the social movement and so on. And the inauguration of the World Social Forum had not a single women speaker. And it was like, hey, you know, this is us. We are all part of it. Um, somehow, none of us, yes, the last one, not a single woman speaker, you know. <clears throat> and then uh, one of the invited guests is Evo Morales, who is a very popular figure, an indigenous person reaching the presidency of Bolivia, a champion of the cause of climate change, and, and, and you know many of those issues and recently he has been looking at problems of genetically modified organisms and food and so on and the problem you know raising of chicken and with uh, lots of hormones and so on and he was very shocked against it and warning people and so on and he basically said be careful because you eat those chicken 
and you become gay. <laughs> okay, almost sounds feminine, and therefore that was the conclusion. But you know, so I am reading this to say, well, those issues are complicated. We are dealing with deeply, deeply, deeply ingrained culture, concepts, and so on, and they are changing, and uh, we have new threats and new issues, but it's not so easy even among our ranks, among the people that we support, we celebrate, and so on. Not everything is clear and wonderful. And, 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 and so how do we uh, work around that is uh, not easy. Uh, we, in many places there is a big discussion about quotas and so on. And I think quotas and targets do help. Uh, the theoretical discussion is very complicated, um, and I guess it's a similar problem as in the economy with subsidies. Subsidies are meant to compensate. If you overdo with subsidies, you can create new problems, but if you don't have them at the proper level, in the proper moment, you never push. So if we don't have certain targets, quotas, and so on, this is not the whole problem, but in practical terms, well, you know, when we inaugurate this assembly, we measure. And we say, okay, we have 42% women delegated. So we are not these women. But at least we set a standard, and, and, and which, you know, it allows us to say which direction are we going or not. But uh, that helps when you have a certain uh, guideline. Of course, it doesn't solve uh, other things. And, and, and one of the things that we did last year with several of the people that are here at the table, Emily and, and uh, Gigi and so on, was to go to the Commission on the Strictures of Women in the UN with a social work report, which was looking at the economic crisis, macroeconomic and women, uh, which is a pretty difficult issue, you know, because in the economy, women are invisible. But if we don't tackle that, you know, we, we, we really don't go to the heart of it. If you challenge, as many of us did in discussions and so on, and I have met people about, okay, what is the impact on women or what is the gender impact of the crisis, the measures and what they're doing and so on, they look like, what do you mean? You know, it's, not women implication here, we're talking about numbers. Numbers don't have gender. If the economy doesn't have gender. No, and they said, hey, you know, come on. When you start looking who is unemployed, who gets fired first, who gets hired the last, who gets double the burden of work at home when the husband is unemployed, and you know, who gets beaten because the husbands are frustrated because they are unemployed and you know. It's always on the side of women. No? And, but the whole care economy is invisible, it's not accounted for. The very instrument of sociology, not just of economy. Because all the economy, the census, the indicators and so on are based on the household. So per capita income and so on, you see per capita are individuals, and then this is counted like that. But the way it is counted is the households are counted. And then it's assumed that everybody in the household is equal. Men, women, children, domestic workers are part of the household also. And they get the same average income. So a lot of poverty is hidden inside the household, and it never uh, gets transmitted from the very start of where we get our indicators from. If we don't start challenging certain things right there, then we don't get it right. You know? And uh, I really think that uh, the Convention on Domestic Workers that Somalia was talking about really has a revolutionary potential, in a sense. And revolutionary, not just in the sense of what he was saying about, okay, informal economy being formalized, rights, social security, whatever, be expanded to a lot of workers in a great majority of women that didn't have those rights before. 
but also because the concept that work at home is work. And so many other women work at home that is not being paid at all, you <laughs> can start thinking of what they do at work if that challenging and the math for that to be counted. And I think that is probably the next uh, generation of our demands and, and thinking and so on that we need to, to move on. So thank you for those answers. I think there have been some really important insights. Um, you were referring and I think Sandra a little about how culture and socialization in this patriarchal society it's embedded in all of the different social movements. I would say of course, including the women's movement as well. And how there are things that are called women's only issues. Because somehow the other social movements continue to see issues that are relevant and a particular effect to women as women only. And therefore, they don't indicate them as part of the central questions of social justice. And also, uh, this question of how these are issues that you need to address also as an individual. That's a very personal commitment. Um, and how we get men to get it, that is not a women's only, but also how we get the collective, um, both men and women, to, to understand the relevance of this. Um, I think, I mean, I really appreciated these comments in terms of nuancing some of the picture. Of course, we're not talking about two completely separate things that you can actually say, this is where the women's movement starts and stops, and this is where all the social movement starts and stops. Because we have lots of women's rights activists. Um, overlapping and part of many different struggles and also different people from other social movements part of these struggles as well. I think that that brings a lot of questions about the complexity and I, I agree very much with you to you about um, the question of historical contextualization um, so that we don't end up talking all about these issues on the back end because it's very easy to generalize and I think um, it's important to maybe look at concrete examples and, um, and as Roberto was saying these are definitely difficult issues to address because they have to do with how each of us relate to the questions of gender inequality or our own identity, but also um, about how we connect with um, um, with the broader agendas. Now, um, Roberto already started addressing a little bit of the next question, no? um, which is okay. Uh, clearly there are tensions and certain dilemmas that need to be named, um, or that will be helpful to name. Um, in this relationship, because it's not just by chance that we haven't managed really to get many other social movements on board to understand the centrality of human rights and gender equality issues. So, can we name some of those tensions? What do you think they are, and how do we address them? We will start by saying, well, what does it's a way clearly you also mentioned as an alternative action um, measure, or working together on very concrete initiatives, for example, going to the UN with particular information and so on. So can you name some of those tensions and can you talk about what do we do to address them? Because I mean we need to kind of move beyond I think too many dialogues like this where we can complain about how bad things are or what how challenging it has been. But okay, so how do we do about it? Because clearly I think we're all losing um, a lot of, of, of the effectiveness that we have working together. So, um, can you name some of those tensions? And I, think, I think some of the tensions arise from um, the differences in terms of understanding what is the issue that we are trying to talk about. Because gender analysis and awareness raising as a foundation for social change has not been understood, both at the uh, movement level by women themselves and our brothers in the movement. And because of that, their tensions, why they consider this to be a woman's issue and not a social justice issue, are the questions that we should be asking. So I think that um, we need to narrow the gap of understanding what the issue is all about, what it involves. There's a lot of pretense that we understand. As I mentioned earlier, yes, we call ourselves feminists, but even that word is not understood, let alone gender equality. So I think that is where we need to begin uh, to bridge the gap. And from there, I think we can move uh, forward together. In many respectable places that have been, networks that shall remain um, nameless, uh, because I don't want to embarrass anyone. I was in, um, 
a general assembly uh, last year of a certain global movement, not one issue on gender was on the agenda. And I raised the question, you are my colleagues. We have known each other for a long time. You are high-flying network leaders. Why is it that you don't even consider gender as an issue? And we'll do better next year. And this year, I noticed there's an agenda there on gender issues. And this is a global network. And I move to the next one, the same thing. So there's a problem here. And those are the tensions that we don't seem to see. Like somebody was saying yesterday, the urgency of the issues around gender. The World Bank and IMF and, and, and those who support them have the agency of bailing out banks. But the social movement has not got an agency to bail out women and men that are victims of gender inequality. So I think those are the tensions. We, we need to begin to see the agency of dealing with these issues. So if I go to a doctor and they scan that I'm producing a baby girl, and I go to a male doctor who is happily removing it, what? What does that mean? Yes, I have a chance to remove it because this is my body, I can control it. But I'm not removing it because I don't want the baby. I'm removing it because somebody in my society says producing girl children is, is not good. And therefore your baby is not welcome. So I take the choice to remove it, than them killing it later on when I'm, I'm, I'm giving birth to it. And somebody should stand up and say, this cannot be done. But when a, a group of people are landless, we are very quick to say these are homeless people and landless people, and yet we are not there to protect issues that concern uh, humanity. Because if we are only producing boys, then there's going to be a serious imbalance. And we don't see that as a social problem for all of us. So I think those are some of the tensions. The other tension is the stigma that goes with gender activists or feminists. The stigma that sometimes is created by people who should know better. And they say, these are male bashers. And yet we have husbands, we have brothers, we have partners, we have fathers. So we are not male bashers. We simply bring to the, to the front issues that confront women, uh, that affect women more than they would affect men. And we know them. Uh, and yet we are seen to be bashing our own brothers. So those are some of the conflicts that I see. Mm -hmm. So we really don't want to change the border a little bit. The question. Oh, okay, no, it was ages. But Marivika quickly shifted. Okay, well, maybe a couple of things. One, one tension, and I think this is not just between women's movements and social movements, but within of all of the movements, is really the north and south tension. The question is, is there still a South perspective or a South political position? Um, and if you would ask uh, Don, we would say yes. But that South uh, feminist, South feminist position is itself contested and diverse across a plural South. Uh, but and at the same time, cannot stand in and of itself and we have to engage with other perspectives i.e. with the north, northern perspective. And when we say south and north, this is the, the economic south and the economic north, is, and that uh, within an international political economy. And I'll tell you why. Because the global governance uh, system and institutions that many of which are actually being pulled back uh, at this time in the plus reviews, we're born out of the context of such divisions. And we think that, uh, and our own, and we just don't think, but we, we analyze from a critical, international, political, economic perspective that the issue of gender 
uh, women's rights and gender equality, including sexual rights and social justice issues, are very much enmeshed in how these inequalities at the global level are playing out. It's time, so let's go for it. And you know, there's no going back. Uh, let's just move on with it. And, uh, and so this is a whole question of tactics and strategies, and a whole question of of how do we really appreciate the and, and, and critically engage with the with the environment. And the other thing is really um, um, uh, the tension between um, sexual rights and, uh, and and women's rights. I mean, again, this has uh, and unfortunately, this has also been uh, it's been used in a negative way, and, and in fact, in order to further divide sexual rights activists and and feminists from each other by certain organizations that work on social justice issues. Uh, and uh, as well as, of course, there are tendencies uh, within both the sexual rights movements and the women's rights organizations uh, about each other's issues. There are some foremost women's rights organizations who have members that have been known to be homophobic and we, we in the South and are also related to some of us. Uh, so, but they are very much on gender equality, well, on uh, women's, you know, promoting women's uh, participation. So. But that's, those are just individuals. I'm not saying they are organizations. So. But then th these are also things that we need to, that, that we need to, to address, that there are, uh, there are social justice uh, activists who are homophobic. Uh, and who would, in fact, um, uh, promote women as a tactic to uh, dismiss or marginalize uh, a resurgent uh, demand for sexual uh, sexual rights uh, recognition uh, within the ranks. No? So it's uh, it's it's complex, uh, and, and there are you know there are those issues that rise and fall. Uh, the third thing I just want to say is also. Um, we in, in Don um, see that there was a time when we won a lot of things for the social justice movement, including women's rights. And those are being eroded. And the fact that uh, northern countries, uh, due to runaway <laughs> financial uh, policies that they, they also promoted worldwide, are having a difficult time with their own uh, economies, do not it, it does not in itself negate or overlook the fact that there have been okay. I'm sorry, just that <coughs> this my hand and the bad time. The time has already passed. And I have to pass the message of Afghan woman. And you know that Afghan woman is the most suffered woman in the world especially for the last 40 years. And uh, what's my suggestion from my sisters and also from my brother? Uh, it's not possible for you to fight for the right of Afghan women in Afghanistan. But many more, we should think about this most suffered human bodies, what you could do for them. I have uh, some, uh, some suggestion. Uh, from you, maybe you could do for them. Uh, you hear from media a lot about Afghan women, including to catch their ear and nose and something uh, a lot. And they have a lot of problem, culture problem, uh, religious problem, uh, man dominance problem, huge, huge. And uh, I think 80% of Afghan women are stopped in the house, as our sister mentioned, from any of that. At this day, do not have the right to go to see their parents, or they do not have the right to go to the market and purchase something for themselves. A lot of. Uh, but maybe that will be a big question for you. What could we do? But we shouldn't look around ourselves. What are, what, are, what are the problems of women and Philippine 
or in Europe on here. We should have it a broader uh, thinking. Uh, unfortunately, in the many meetings I can see in South Asia and Europe and other countries, there are not Afghan women to be about. If today there would be one Afghan woman, I'm sure they could receive some capacity, empowerment, and some linkage. If the push comes to shore, they will always retreat to Pakistan as a, as, a, as, a, as a frame to sort of define itself against the oppression. And therefore for us, even, even when in Kenya we're speaking about human rights, and, and I'm sure there are many people who are knowledgeable of, of, on, the, on the whole notion of question of universality of human rights. Because when you start talking about human rights, then you start, then somebody starts talking, are human rights really universal or not? So I think there are other concepts which I think we need to address. The second point is the whole notion of, of how social movements come into existence. Um, I know the women's movement may not have emerged if social movements were really a hinge on certain values that women's movement could aspire to. So shouldn't we even dare to think that the women's movement was actually a challenge to social movements. And in a way that the women's movements were really bringing in something new that the social movements did not have. Um, and so if, if we can think even broadly, uh, because I think also that the women's movement brings in a value system, uh, a notion of principles. Should we be thinking that simply because social movements exist, why do, do, do they exist? They exist for a cause, they exist for many things, but are they rooted in any principles? So should it also be thinking beyond this and saying then that it shouldn't simply be obvious that, um, that we exist because we are farmers' movements, we are people who are uh, organized around land rights, but should it really hinge this on, I think, on part particular progressive values? And that may not necessarily be universal also, because perhaps in the north and south we don't see things differently. They may be very specific, but then, as, as you mentioned, the issue of consensus, we don't need to agree. But if it's specific to me, and to my locality, then that is what I ascribe. But then there could be solidarity across board or even silence in a way that the North or the South or, or that protection does not work uh, in a way that uh, contradicts what I say, I, I think, as part, of, uh, as part of, the, of the movement. So I think for me, is we really need to see how, how to, how to re-engineer this whole understanding of, of how we operate within this space. Uh, space that is whether it's social movements or, or, or women's movements or per se or, 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 the, or the sort of I think uh, in relations uh, between both of those spaces. Thank you, share um, some of the issues that we were also grappling with in the previous uh, And just to underscore the, the dilemma, I'd like to start with a small story. Uh, without naming names, there is a, you know, a very progressive coalition focused on economic issues. And within that coalition is a very strong women's rights activist also part of the coalition. Uh, so they unite around issues on debt, trade, aid, um, and on that basis they have also alliances with the church and the Catholic. But precisely because of the alliance with the Catholic Church, when the issue of reproductive rights and reproductive health came up, the alliance refused to take a stand because they did not want to bring the, the, the coalition, the unity, uh, with this, particularly not only with the church, but with other so-called progressive groups who was not clear on the reproductive health care. And that, that's a very real dilemma. That's a very real dilemma. And it got us to thinking that there seems to be a set of trade-offs in relation to uh, you know, hierarchies of rights. You know, what are the issues and what are our priority of issues and why oftentimes women's only issues end up in the lower part of that list. 
Um, and you know, we were asking ourselves, and I was asking myself, where is all of this coming from? And we say that, of course, with this lack of understanding within and among ourselves, um, we need to deepen our, our, our discussions, our analysis. But I think, bottom line, we have to deal with the fact that we're also dealing with patriarchal male, male resistance. There is, and not just among the men, but even some women who think that way. It's patriarchal resistance even within social justice movements. And we need to deal with that and confront that, that, that question in a much more, maybe in a much more constructive, but also uh, decisive way. Because we are talking about our brothers and sisters in our midst. And it's happening within our midst. So how do we, how do we deal with that? Um, so when we, obviously, we are already going into the realm of, you know, deeply embedded values and issues around socialization, which is very much, I mean, the arena of where many of our issues, or the problems in relation to many of our issues are coming from. So I think that that's one, that's one level or area of conversation that we need to start having as well, within and among us. Thank you, Wendy. I don't know that it's only all my interventions from participants. Only um, vice One of the things that we ask at the global level to ourselves is, have we done enough um, to ourselves as women's rights organizations, as um, families from the South? I mean, why? aren't our issues not being taken on board? Have we done enough as well? Uh, and, and this is something that is, I think, also part of the other side of the point. Um, it is, of course, you know, as we know in our personal lives, uh, too close to wishful thinking to assume that men will respect you on the level of full having your full rights as women and as, as, as a human being. And it's, it goes the same way with organizations and with comrades and colleagues and, um, and partners in the social movement or brothers and sisters, uh, you know, that we talk about here. Uh, so I think there is also a level of um, the situation also calls for women's organizations and feminists to advance a more um, coherent, a more, uh, uh, a stronger analysis as well as a more pinpointed provocation. Now, and I'm not saying that this is not uh, taking place, it is, but then again, given the context and, and the multiple uh, the, the, the ferocious environment uh, where uh, debates, open debates, and even questions of uh, of, of trust and uh, personal safety and or censorship um, uh, are, are are very real. Um, it's difficult, you know, to to have to, to move forward um, such discussions. So. Um, I think there is also a challenge that is facing the women's rights movements. Are, are we simply the numbers in the streets that are mobilized uh, to support something out there uh, for photo ops, uh, for balancing genders during opening plenaries, or even during interventions uh, uh, in the General Assembly? or wherever, uh, I mean, we need to question also this. I'm not saying they are uh, not significant all the time, because in many places they do have a symbolic value. But I think when it comes to doing this in a routine way and losing very much the, the politics and what comes next, what's linked to that, I think this is where we also we also falter. And the other thing is the tension between women and men will always be permanent. It's a permanent tension. It's a tension between, because there are two 
human beings, tensions among human beings will be permanent tensions. Now, how do we deal with permanent tensions? We just have to embrace the tensions and to embrace the conflict, embrace the plural plurality, but at the same time also not in uh, not insist that what is mine is mine and what is yours is yours. I mean, uh, I would think that um, even in the face of uh, diversity that there is some universal set of social justice principles that and, and demands that we can agree, agree on. But that needs to be debated. Uh, and, and this is the debate is not, as, as we say, the best idea is not to have one but to have many ideas. So the best idea comes from many ideas and not just from one idea. It doesn't come from only one perspective. But I, and, and, and it is, for Social Mundial already started the, the, some of the principles that govern ethical dialogue. But, uh, but then, of course, these are efforts. And, uh, and, and we just have to keep on learning and then trying to move forward with, uh, in the, way that, the best way that we can in order to really try to grapple with the with the situation which is very, very challenging to us. And let's not keep that, keep a, our blinders on. This is not a dinner party <laughs> or crochet dinner that we have now as an environment. We are all, you know, very much uh, at risk by a lot of limitations that are being put in our way as civil society, you know, including new ways of so-called partnerships you know, and where the money is going and who is setting the agenda and, and how, you know, uh, I, I, I think I saw someone or uh, somewhere that it is not those that are reacting <laughs> You know, we're all reacting, but then there are those that are setting the agenda. And I, and I think this is, you know, something that we still need to uh, to really have a discussion on. Uh, some of us, in responding to a changed situation, it's just like a family, you know. You know, we're together. When we were 30 years old, we used to do things differently. When we are 14 or 50, we used to do things differently too, given the, the cycle that we have. Well, the cycle that we have, the environment that we have, is a very difficult environment. It's not as if, you know, we can do things as usual, but then again, there are some of us who want to move forward too fast, too soon. They think they know, they define the, what's going on when situations are still fluid, you know, and then there's no room for discussion. How can somebody call or do an email and say, we need to launch an event and we need a global event. Uh, can you mobilize in three days or one week's time? Some people to show up, you know, without really moving the issue at the grassroots level. I mean, these are things that are also affecting us now. No? Thank you, Judith. We're going towards the end. Um, and I would just like to give you know, over uh, five minutes, you know, five minutes to say so. Uh, final thoughts. So, um, you want to go first? I just want to say that the struggle for social justice is long and hard. And um, um, I think the women's movement globally has done a lot. Um, we still have to do more because the struggle is long and hard. But this struggle to some of us is about life and death. And we walk villages, we walk communities, as Paulo Freire used to say, if you do not conscientize people to understand what is happening to them, why it is happening, and what they themselves can do about their situation, then your struggle is in vain. So I agree that we need to continue building grassroots movement